Hi, Bob. Did you get my message? I just texted you. I didn't. I didn't get your message. I apologize. That's okay. I, I, we were I, we were able to move his, uh, his speaking time up, so he oh. won't have. He'll be a few minutes late, but won't have to do the on and off. Oh, great! So, what time do you think he'll come on? Maybe about ten after. That's perfect. 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 Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Cheryl. You were the ones doing all the. The adjusting here. I'm just trying to, you know, do what I can. <laughs> That's all we're doing. <laughs> we're doing everything we can. Yep. No problem. All right. So that's great. Um, is it, is he, was there any a plan for him to do share anything on his screen? Did he have any, any graphics of any kind? No. Okay. He's just going to get on and speak for a few minutes and then right. he'll take questions. Okay. Uh, you, you saw some of the prepared questions I sent. Yes, he's answering some of those directly in his remarks. Okay, great. So we'll <clears throat> open it up for discussion and that'll be terrific. And we'll do a little tap dance for 10 minutes until he arrives. I'm happy to explain it to everyone if you'd like. That would be terrific. Um, great. Right now, I just see your name. Maybe, I don't know whether you want to be uh, seen on screen. Um, my, uh, where I am, I lose signal very easily. So if I try oh. to do screen, I'm up in Sussex County tonight. So uh -huh. if I do screen, uh, voice and screen, I will lose connect my connection. Oh, all right. Fine. We, I am, just... we uns you hear Josh talk about broadband all the time. We are unstable. <laughs> okay. When he talks about that, that's, it's me he's talking about. Uh-huh. And people up here. All right. So I expect a good number of people here. So we'll need to talk and discuss and let people know what's going on. And then when he comes on, we can he can begin discussion and take questions and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean it's a really actually a really good lesson in civics, if nothing else. This uh -huh. is this is what he does, you know, what we do. All right. Any idea what Congress is voting on this evening that's got him held up? You any clue? I think they're talking about salt. Ah. So I don't think is... they're voting on it yet. I think they're discussing it. Oh, so he needs to be there to yeah. he's 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 uh advocating for this, am I correct? Not something he can miss. I'm sorry. Right. He's advocating for salt. He is. Okay. So that's important that he be there to add to the conversation. Absolutely. All right, terrific. Um, we'll, we'll wing it from there, and I may have a uh, have someone who does political things on the news and on and so on and so forth. He may be able. He's a professor from St. Peter's College. Um, he may be also add, able to help to, with our discussion. That's awesome. So we'll see how that goes. But I appreciate your efforts. I know that you probably are always doing these things all the time, having this shuffle and shift to try to make things work. Yeah, if you're not flexible, this kind of life isn't for you. Right. All right. Well, flexibility is uh, a good thing. You got to be able to roll with the punches. Absolutely. Since I have you here, yeah. um, I will. Can, how are you guys doing? I know, like we mentioned, Rabbi Fine was in Israel. How right. are, have you heard any problems with uh, passports? We're having such a struggle with them. And I want to encourage anybody who needs help to give us a call. Oh, all right. You should definitely mention that. I have not heard of any. Uh, the rabbi did not um, allude to that. I met with him Sunday morning. He was leaving uh, Sunday midday. So I uh, didn't hear any backlash in any negative way. That's excellent. But f the fact that you're making that offer is important. And it's also somewhat indicative about people's willingness to travel or now Israel's was was not mask mandate, and now it is mask mandate. So continues to vacillate. Yeah, we. Um, I just literally got off the phone with the consulate, uh, Israeli consulate in Manhattan, in New York. Mm -hmm. We have somebody traveling tomorrow, and their permit hadn't come in yet. Oh. All right. Does the State Department make so exception for that? Over there, the consulate general, and we got their permit expedited. Good work. Good work.
So let's see, it's a few minutes early, so people will start coming on in the next five, six minutes. We'll kind of do a more formal intro or hello at eight o'clock and introduce you. What's your official title, Cheryl? Deputy Chief of Staff. Ah, okay. I like that. <laughs> How long have you had this position? So I've been with the office almost, it'll be two years in a couple days. Um, I've been deputy chief for you know, 18 months. Right before the pandemic, I was promoted. Good, hope you got a raise with that. <laughs> <clears throat> Rather than the title. All right, so Josh is actually going, he's in, he's in a discussion, but he's not on the floor of the of Congress. No, he's on the floor talking, no, nope, he's on the floor. Or having a discussion on the floor about salt. Yeah, they're having a, it's like, um, it's like a special order hour, I think is what they call it. Uh-huh. And how are the rest of the congressmen able, are they just viewing this from their webcams or? No, the, the, they're all in person. In person? The house is I, fully in, the house is fully in person again. Wow. But do they actually show yeah, up? If you turn I on C SPAN, you can see it. Hmm? Oh. So he, 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 yeah, yeah. if I turn on C SPAN, I'm going to see uh, a, full, uh, a full house of representatives? You, there's, I think they're still socially distant, so they're bringing them in and out when it's their I turn see. to speak. Uh huh. But yeah, if you turn on C SPAN at 801, from 801 to 804, he will be speaking. Okay. Well, I hope he makes a convincing argument. We uh, any idea when this actually goes before Congress for a vote? I do not. I'm sure that's down the line. Yeah, so I mean that's a great question. You can ask him. This is not committee work we're talking about. Um, this would have to be part of like a bigger legislative package. I see. So salt in conjunction with something else. Yeah, I don't think it would be standalone, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Interesting. I did sometimes, yes, I'm often often amazed at how packages come together, what's in them. Uh, it's true. It <laughs> becomes quite interesting to hear all of the different pieces in a, in a piece of legislation, which I did not expect. Okay, so we'll have to wait a few, a few more minutes and before we welcome everyone, that people will be joining us slowly. Is it sweltering in Washington? Um, I spoke to, so I'm up in the district today. Oh, okay. um, so yes, it's sweltering here, we all know. Uh, um, I spoke, sure. it's in the, I think nine, I think it was 92 <clears throat> there today. So pretty hot. But not yes. much here. I understand. Okay, some people will be joining us slowly, and we shouldn't have any problem meeting that 10, 15 minute wait. Should work out just fine. Okay. <clears throat> People are joining us and we'll soon get uh, involved. Okay. Alan's here. Want to talk to Alan? Alan, can you hear me? Yeah. Alan, can you hear me now? Hi, Bob. How are you? Okay, good. I got your uh, message uh, just before. I'm not sure what, uh, what you're well, asking. Well, you, but... things, things have changed a bit. This is a very fluid situation. Okay. Uh, Cheryl will explain in a minute. Originally, he had to go back and forth and back and forth, but okay. things have changed, and he may be 10 minutes late. Okay. So we'll do some introductions, and with your help, we'll talk a little bit about American Rescue or whatever else uh, we should want to talk about, and then okay. he will be able to join us. So it won't okay. be an in and out situation. Okay. And I, if it was in and out, I was going to ask your help with some of those interludes, but I don't think we're going to have to do that uh, now. <laughs> Okay, well, whatever, whatever you want. Um, Cheryl, will, Cheryl will explain in a minute that 
he's on the house, the floor of the house. I see. And he's advocating for assault, and he's there from eight to eight oh four in official okay. uh, capacity. Okay. So yes, he he's a, it's not a full. Com it's a not it's not committee. It's a full uh, house situation. House is in session. People are not just sitting back. So yeah. Well, apparently. Yeah, that that's the job of a congressman. Right. <laughs> the hours are crazy. The hours are crazy. They're worse than lawyers' hours. They're worse than uh, journalist hours. They're congressmen's yeah. hours. <laughs> wow. So basically, he's he's advocating for salt, and he's trying to you know, do that in front of right. the congressman. So okay. Um, in a couple of minutes, I'll have Cheryl introduce. But that's anything fine. You can do to help me along the way it would be super. No problem. Let me just uh, walk away so that my wife can log on to another computer because she wants oh. to be uh, listening to this. But I'm here. I'm here. Okay. No problem. Sure. Welcome, Bob and James and Joe. Thank you. Good evening, evening on this sweltering day. Yeah, I finally put my AC on in the house. Finally. Finally. I don't know, Bob. Well, I. I, I I can take the heat, but uh, it got to be too humid, so uh -huh. I give So if everyone's joining us, uh, you can go on mute for the moment. And we'll tell you when you can unmute and ask questions. It would be great if you can mute yourself for the moment. Coming up uh, a couple minutes to go before eight o'clock. Okay. Not everyone could be here. It's my first time uh, securing a congressman. And I hope to secure the congressman live to come to our shul uh, at a time where you can personally meet him and ask questions. So we're going to look at October for some dates and see if uh, the congressman would be available. So we're going to, as we come out of the pandemic, we hope to do some things in person and on Zoom, I guess, for those that can't make it. So welcome everyone so far. We're getting there. Everyone is not melting on today's with today's temperature. Pablo Peter will appreciate the fact that I did play golf today in 100, 100 degree weather. Wow, you're there. That's impressive. You know, your golf course calls, Bob. It's it's a, it's a hard to leave it alone. <laughs> Twenty one. Got a quick uh, 111, so I'm doing great. Oh, I have to raise the book sale. Where'd you get on the second nine? <laughs> Mark, well, yeah. if it gets any hotter than 111, I walk off the course. <laughs> oh. All right, we are at eight o'clock. I want to welcome everyone to our presentation this evening in Temple Israel's continuing programming um, of a variety of speakers that inform, educate, and illuminate a variety of different things. So here. Uh, please mute yourself if you can, so we will give time for questions later, and then we can unmute. That would be truly appreciated. Um, I want to introduce Cheryl Krauss, who's uh, on the screen here somewhere. Um, let's see her name. I am here. All right, Cheryl. And Cheryl is of staff. Uh, all right, let's see if we can get everyone to mute. Hang on a second. Get everyone muted here. And there we go. We got a few more that are doing that. Anyhow, introducing Cheryl Hi. Krauss. Deputy Chief oh, of Staff. The congressman you? is on, Bob. Oh, wonderful, fantastic. Well, 
I'm so de delighted that Congressman Gottheimer could join us. It's a privilege. Welcome. Cheryl, why don't you introduce because you're Deputy Chief of Staff and you can do a better job than I can. All right, thanks uh, well, so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I'd like to introduce you to Congressman Josh Gottheimer for the New Jersey's 5th Congressional District. Coming to us and live from Washington, D.C. All right, Congressman, thank you so much for taking the time. I know you've been a very busy man. Um, why don't you tell us what you were doing in the floor of the House just moments ago? Well, I'm actually waiting to go on and speaking. Oh. So I apologize if they mix, they move the times around a little bit. So um, if I have to jump suddenly, I apologize in advance. Um, uh, but I wanted to make sure I said hi to you and uh, I'm sorry for the moving schedule. And in fact, my speech is not even with me that I was giving to you tonight. It's in my office. So um, uh, I'm gonna do this off the cuff and, and I hope, uh, so you'll have to remind me about uh, any topics you wanted to make sure that I covered. Okay. Um, but, but um, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm really honored to be here with all of you and I'm, I'm very grateful uh, that you're having me. I know the rabbi's actually in uh, Israel, right? Correct. Um, so Bob, thank you so much for hosting me and, and, you know, and, and, you know, what would be most helpful here and how can I, what, what would you like me to cover? And, and, and well, why, uh, don't you, sorry, why don't you, why don't you address the topic of salt, which you were about to go and speak in Congress about, bring us up to speed. Excellent. Well, 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 first, thank you again for having me, um, you know, just to give a, a perspective on what's going on here um, in Congress and what we're working on. So I'm about to go speak about the state and local tax deduction and reinstating that, which as you probably all followed in 2017, um, some of the red states got together in their tax plan and decided to gut the state and local tax deduction and cap it out at $10,000. Um, it used to always be going back to 1913 that you could deduct fully off your, uh, before you paid your federal taxes, anything you paid in your state taxes, your property taxes, your local taxes, um, they ended that and capped it out at $10,000 in 2017. So many of us have been fighting hard to fully reinstate SALT and actually give those of us in Northern New Jersey a break and actually give us some tax relief. Um, that's what we've been fighting for now since then. We're getting very close. And the way we think we're gonna Go do it, frankly, are, are two ways, one, Right now, we're going to, I'm hoping, pass a bipartisan infrastructure package that I've been working very hard on with some of my colleagues that? in the yeah, House. And Senate. I want to stay on this for a couple minutes. Sorry, I think somebody's just got to hit mute if that's okay. Sure. Um, thanks so much. Sorry. And um, so that's one thing that I'm very focused on is, and we could talk a little bit more about infrastructure in a minute, but the other big package where there's an opportunity for us to reinstate SALT will be something called a reconciliation package. So we may do something to change and address the tax package um, in the coming months. And what I'm fighting for is for SALT to reinstate the deduction fully to be part of that. Um, you know, so you know, there's many things, as you know, as your congressman that I, I work on all the time. And I've been really focused on the infrastructure piece, the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, um, getting our water infrastructure addressed. Um, and the rural areas I represent, rural broadband, um, the gateway tunnel, the tunnel between New York and New Jersey, getting a new tunnel built. That's where the train goes. Right now, the old train tunnel is 110 years old and crumbling. Um, so that's, you know, getting infrastructure done has been a very big priority of mine. And we've been able to get Democrats and Republicans together about that. The other thing that I've been really focused on, um, uh, which is relevant, of course, to, uh, to, to folks here, is of course the U.S.-Israel relationship, which I'm happy to talk about as well. Um, and you know, so there's there's a, a lot of a lot of issues. And and I know Iris here um, has worked in my office and helped me get elected in the first place. And he knows about a lot of these issues and can talk about them more than me. Um, and I'm, uh, but I just wanted, but that's a quick overview of of what we're working on and what I'm about to go speak about. All right, that's terrific. So can I ask you a question about that? Of course you can. Um, so this goes with the issue of uh, Israel. Um, the Democratic Party in, in supporting Israel seems to be fraying. How serious and widespread is the growing antipathy to Israel in Congress and among your constituents? Well, you know, I, I think it's way overblown in terms of the reality of where Democrats are toward the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship. I, th I will say there are certain of my colleagues who are particularly loud about their opposition and effective in communicating their 
uh, their disagreement with a bipartisan, with the historically bipartisan approach to the U.S. as a relationship, which is what I believe and most of my colleagues believe is that this relationship is essential to America's national security, to our to protecting our interests in the region, in our fight against terror, whether that's Hamas or Hezbollah or Palestinian jihad um, um, uh, or vis-a-vis -vis Iran. It's very important for us to have a very strong relationship and that relationship has always been bipartisan. Um, I think we've seen in recent years uh, uh, creeping in of certain rhetoric, which is alarming to me. And I saw it during the US, the most recent, sorry, Israel uh, Israeli conflict with Hamas, which, by the way, just so you know, in case there's any confusion, Hamas is a terrorist organization that attacked our, our democracy, you know, our ally, Israel, right? Um, so the, the democracy in the region, our democratic ally, um, in case there's any confusion about that. And, and just to put this in further perspective, most of my colleagues, agreed that we need to, just, to stand by Israel in that conflict. They did not agree that we should side with, um, with Hamas. There are a few of my colleagues who took a different perspective on that. But again, I would say it's a very rare, that's a rare perspective in the caucus and that most believe we need to stand strongly by Israel and, but, and our MOU, our, our long hist historic relationship um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, so I, I think that's a much more accurate uh, uh, painting of the relationship. And you've got people like me who are, of course, very vocal about standing up to those who make comments like, like we recently saw from my party, those some a few people in my party who said called Israel a terrorist state and apartheid state. And I think those comments are anti-Semitic. And I said, as, I said as so much. So... <clears throat> Going along with that, or in, in line with that question, by the way, just a housekeeping, if anyone would like to ask a question, please put it on chat so I can give it to the congressman. So take your time to go on chat and write a question if you'd like. Um, so in that last comment you made, this question follows very well. How do you assess the state of anti-Semitism in the US today? And what can Congress do to help right now? And how do you personally deal on both a daily and a long-term basis for the anti-Semitism that's demonstrated by certain members of Congress in both parties, which I find alarming. Well, as someone who's, you know, when, when comments were made in the last Congress um, about Israel and the Benjamins and having a hypnotic state in the world, I, I was the one with several of my colleagues, but I led the letter and the resolutions against my colleagues. Again, the few splinter loud colleagues in the Democratic caucus. Um, but so uh, that's what I'd say about in the, in the Congress, because I don't find that to be a widespread problem. I'd say in the country, it is a widespread problem. We've seen whether it's white supremacists or, or um, those on the very far left um, who question my loyalty to the country uh, because uh, of my work on the USS relationship or others, um, you know, it, you look at ADL's numbers, New Jersey is, I think, second highest in the country in terms of anti-Semitic incidents. We've, we've seen over the last years, especially as social media has exploded um, and, and a, a surge of anti-Semitism of just hate in general toward all groups, um, but a huge surge of anti-Semitism, not just here, but around the world. And I'm very concerned about it. It's, 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 a, it's an alarming trend that I think, you know, we have to quell immediately but I also recognize that, in, that it's not just hate targeted at Jews, it's also hate targeted at lots of people because people right now, I feel that the, in many ways, the, the top of the cauldron has been lifted off and it's, there's the, the hatred that's been kept down is kind of spewing over. And um, I think as a kind of why I work so much to work across the aisle and try to bring more civility to the Congress because um, I think we need to bring the temperature down of the country overall and not scream at each other and not tweet nasty things at each other. And I think that will help overall bring down the temperature. So the bringing down the temperature, is that through more advocacy and support uh, <clears throat> being vocal 
to not let those single voices. You, you, you speak out against it wherever you see it, whenever you see it. For instance, today, I wrote a letter to the president of Rutgers mm -hmm. about the, uh, the uh, visiting professor union at Rutgers uh, issued a statement which I felt to be full of misinformation and hate-filled, saying that, that Rutgers should not be investing a dime in anything to do with Israel and making very pro-Palestinian comments and anti-Israel comments. I called on the, the president of Rutgers to immediately speak out against those comments, uh, like I did a couple of weeks ago when he backed off of a statement that Rutgers made um, uh, in support of, of, of the uh, Israelis during the conflict and against anti-Semitism when you know there was a huge surge of anti-Semitic activity in Times Square and on college campuses. All right. And let me uh, change the subject a little bit while you've got, I still got you. Uh, what do you think President Biden is on student loan forgiveness? I know where most senators are. Um, sorry, um, my colleague is texting me off the floor just saying that I have four minutes left. And if I, I'll leave and come back in five minutes, if that's okay with you. When yes, I of course it is. We'll, we'll, what was we'll that? amongst ourselves while you're, while you're no, away. But, but, but go ahead. What was your call? I, it seems like I, got, I can do one more. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. Where do you think President Biden is on student loan forgiveness? Student loan forgiveness. I mean, uh, I, I think like me, he believes that we need to do some something to make college more affordable. You know, I, I, you know, whether that's the rate of interest, um, the, the ability for students to refinance their loans so that students aren't leaving with a mortgage on their back and not you know, going to the workforce at a job. Um, I think there's a lot of concern about the cost of college, and you know, I think we all share that concern. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, some proposals I've seen where we just do pure forgiveness and for everybody. I mean, a lot of those proposals don't um, make sense. This, and uh, you know, I, I, we just can't afford to do that. I also think it's important to have, you know, a stake in your education. Um, but I think overall we have to make it much more affordable. I don't know exactly where the president is on on what he's doing and not doing, but on this just yet specifically, but I know he shares the concern that many of us have that we've got to address the high cost of college. Okay, I gotta, I'm gonna, excuse All me right, one second. Friend, so I'll be right, I'll be friend. right back. I'll be right back, okay? Just give me five right. minutes. Thanks. All right, we'll give you five minutes and come on back. So in that interim, um, I have Alan, thank goodness, I have Alan Sanders uh, on one of our screens. And uh, Alan, um, Maybe you could help us in this five minute interlude, either that or preparing questions for the congressman or discussing um, any of the programs that he's talked about, even the American Rescue Program, um, Rescue Plan, and where that stands. Where do you think we can go with this, Alan? Well, um, I mean, one important uh, element of uh, Congressman uh, Gottheimer's career is that he's a, a member of the um, Problem Solvers Caucus, and uh, perhaps he can enlighten us uh, when he comes back as to what that is. Um, generally speaking, I mean, we'll see what his perspective on it is. It's a coalition of moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans who try to get together and devise solutions to um, what they perceive to be the various problems and concerns facing the country. And their uh, strategy, I believe, is to sort of build uh, from the middle out. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see whether that works. Uh, it would be interesting to ask him where this strategy has worked recently and okay. also find out uh, where the problems lie in, in creating such a coalition. He's a moderate Democrat. He gets along with moderate Republicans. Um, he is, uh, as he's made clear, uh, somewhat uh, in the middle and has some uh, disagreements on various questions uh, with his more liberal colleagues. Um, but he is, he is a moderate Democrat in large measure because I think that's his philosophy, but it's also because of the district that he represents. He has a large Republican constituency. Um, in the northwest uh, of the district. And of course he has a much more liberal constituency uh, in the areas where uh, we tend to live. So uh, he, he does he has to do a careful balancing act in, in the way he approaches issues. Because he's replacing a Congressman who was extremely right-wing conservative. And yes, I mean, his predecessor was, uh, uh, I, I suppose, uh, you know, it's hard to understand. It's hard to know what he would be in today's Congress, but certainly uh, when he served, he was on the extreme. He was not just a conservative Republican, but he was an extremely conservative Republican. Um, and again, it had to do with uh, with the district. 
there. Um, and, um, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things that's always interesting about members of Congress is you always have to look at their district. That tells you a lot about the positions that they take. It's not like, you know, you run for Congress and you say, I care about this, I care about that, I'm gonna fight for this, I'm gonna fight for that. That will not get you elected. Uh, you need to be a professional politician. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It's the same thing as any other job. When you apply for a job, you better know what the company is that you're working for and what its priorities are, and you better fit in with those priorities. That's true in any job. And people forget that about members of Congress. It's a job and the hiring committee are the, uh, are the constituents. And so you can't stray too far from where the middle of your constituents are. Now, the middle may be actually the middle, uh, it may be the left because that's where the middle lies in your in your district. That the left is is the predominant uh, view of the constituents. It might be the right. Uh, most of your constituents are conservative, but you always aim for the middle of your constituency uh, because that's the way you're going to keep your job. Makes good sense. By the way, you were mentioning to me that he's also on a couple other committees. Can you remember what those committees are? Um, yes. Uh, I believe, and uh, th this might make for some important questions, he is on the Homeland Security Committee of the House. And as we know, Homeland Security with the uh, uh, insurrection on January the 6th and all the issues related to that is very much on, on topic. It might be interesting to ask him whether he's interested on serving in the panel that Speaker Pelosi has just announced a special uh, select committee to investigate um, the January 6th event. Uh, he's on Homeland Security, so he might be a candidate for that. He might be interested in it. Uh, worth asking him. He's also on, uh, I don't, I'm not sure I have the um, exact uh, title or name of the committee, but something like the Financial Services Committee right. of the House. Um, so obviously he knows uh, and he's involved in all the financial issues and legislation. More broadly speaking, he must be knowledgeable about the economy. It would be interesting to ask him about uh, where he thinks the economy is going. Um, there's a rosy picture, of course, coming out of the Biden administration about where the economy is heading. Uh, Republicans have a somewhat less positive view. Uh, there is inflation um, and uh, it's sort of a mixed economy. Things are booming in certain sectors, but again, uh, you know, a lot of employers are suggesting that they're having trouble hiring workers. So it's a complex situation and might be interesting to see what his uh, impressions and take are on, on this mixed uh, situation uh, on the economy. Uh, that's an important question. And I think, uh, by the way, just for everyone's information, uh, we have Scott Salmon coming on on July 8th, I believe. And Scott is a, an attorney on, that's, that represents different uh, governmental institutions and works on uh, the issue of uh, voter suppression and trying to work against it. And um, he's fought against, uh, I guess, Kanye West to try to be a presidential candidate here. And he got that taken care of. And he's also helped in Ridgewood on a special committee. Matt uh, Lindenberg will tell us a little more about that. But Scott is coming up on July 8th, also worth, very worthwhile listening to. So when he comes back, uh, people do have people have put questions in the chat. I encourage you to do more. Eric Weiss must have a question. I can't let him sit there and not have a question. So we got to put that into into the program and see if we can pin him down a little bit. So his role is well, certainly from these questions and positions, extraordinarily complex, and it would be very interesting to see how he can respond without a script, which I think that's what he was doing. Right. So, very nice to get him away. Sure. Um, but what's also interesting, and I wouldn't ask him this um, oh. because uh, to embarrass him, because every congressman does it. Um, uh, you know, um, everybody has the notion that when a, you go make a speech on the floor of the House or the floor of the Senate, for that matter, they're all they're all there listening to everybody. You know, and uh, they're nodding their heads or disagreeing with it. There's this notion that everybody is there. That's not true. Uh, typically, and I don't know what the situation is uh, tonight, uh, typically uh, you get your time to speak and there's typically nobody around on the floor except uh, a few people, one from the majority party, one from the uh, minority party, there's the presiding officer there. Uh, and mostly it's to make that speech so that it goes into the congressional record. Uh, and that's important because that's what the members, all of them, uh, Congressman Gottheimer included, uh, will tell you they were on the floor of the House, they argued for this uh, position, and as he told us, what he intends to argue tonight is about the, the SALT uh, limitations, he wants to remove that. Um, 
And so it's, it's important because that way you see what your congressman is doing, what your congressman is saying, what his positions are. It sets them out. But in terms of convincing colleagues, that's not where the convincing occurs because nobody sits there to hear everybody else speak. It would be a tremendous waste of time for all of them to do so. Uh, they know what they think because they meet constantly in committees, in caucuses, in the hallways, on phone calls. Nobody wants to listen to another congressman's speech because they already know what uh, they, they each think. So when they go to the floor to make a speech, typically, typically, it's basically to go on record uh, with whatever position they want, which is for the benefit of us, uh, the citizens. It's not for the benefit of their colleagues. But again, I wouldn't ask him how many people were on the floor tonight when you spoke, because that wouldn't be fair. Uh, they all do that. They all do that. And they do it um, for our benefit, uh, but not for the benefit of their colleagues. Let me ask if uh, her, the, his uh, deputy chief of staff, Cheryl, is still with us, if she can uh, unmute and tell us what she sees uh, on the floor, what her experience is uh, now that Congress is back in session. So although she did tell me they do social distance, which means that they're only allowing certain number numbers in, um, but I'd be interested to hear that if um, she's still with us, but she could be preoccupied. <laughs> um, I'm not, never sure. I, Cheryl? I, I, Cheryl, I am actually watching the floor right now and um, waiting for him to come on and speak. But I work out of the district. So while I have you here, I can let you know some of the things we do in the district that can help you or help members of the temple or friends and family. Um, Josh just walked up, you turn on C-SPAN, you can probably see him on the floor right now. Um, so our constituent services teams can help with things like, right now it's passports. Um, if you have problems with uh, New Jersey unemployment, we can help with that. Um, we can help with Medicaid, Medicare, um, Pretty much if you, in social security, if you can name it and you're having problems, um, or even if you're not sure and you um, think you have a problem that somebody you need help with, give our office a call. We can talk to you about it and we can, if we can't help you directly, we can direct you on where you need to go. And I'll give you that number right now. I mean, it's online as well. Um, in Glenrock, it's 201-389-1100. And we have a full constituent services team that can um, you know, help with pretty much anything you may need. Cheryl, thank you. Maybe you could put that on chat as well so <clears throat> people will see the number. Happy and, to. Yes. I'll give you my email address as well. Okay. So it's good to know that we have the ability to interact with the Congressman's office and uh, help him resolve issues that we may have. So he should be coming back on shortly. People have been asking questions, which are good. I have about six or seven in the chat. I look forward to asking him those questions when he returns. So if he's on the house, he's basically, as you said, making his statement for the record, and then he'll come back. It's obviously not a dialogue. Um, he is, uh, this is not committee uh, work that he's doing because this is not a committee position. Um, but I would like to ask him when um, he thinks SALT might come to a vote and in these committees working forward uh, when this might come to uh, into a bill. But as I've learned, and Alan can probably share, Alan, you can share on this. I've learned that uh, like in the American Rescue Plan, I thought they were gonna do certain things and they are gonna pass a certain uh, vote or a law. And then I find there's 28 other attachments to it. So a bill has this, this uh, trawler's worth of other pieces added to it, which go far beyond uh, what was the original intent. Um, I don't know whether that's, uh, I think that's, whether that's piggybacking or um, I forget what the term was when they used to do it in the past when um, they would uh, add these additional med pieces. But can you share a little bit about that, why a bill has so many attachments? Yeah, um, and it's basically um, the art of compromise. That is to say many of these bills uh, and they're mega bills um, um, have provisions in them uh, in order to attract uh, various uh, elements um, uh, and uh, positions um, from various members of Congress. That is to say, it may be very difficult to pass a particular bill because there's not enough people who would actually uh, create a majority. Or if you're talking about the Senate, there may not be 60 votes to um, halt a filibuster. Uh, um, and so uh, what, what you really got is uh, they create what's known as a Christmas tree bill. Um, and that is to gather enough support 
uh, from enough members of Congress so that these bills go forth. And the Christmas tree bill will have provisions that various segments of Congress support. There will be the heart of the matter, uh, uh, but what you try to do is you try to attach these riders or amendments to a bill that is very likely to pass uh, so, that, uh, uh, so that it will pass and these various elements uh, are, are attached to it so that you get the support of, of some of the various members that are sort of on the outside of, of the heart of the matter. The bills that where this happens most often, uh, I mean, it could happen on the infrastructure bill here uh, because of the particular political situation we're facing, but the ones to really watch for are the defense appropriation bills. Every Every administration, every Congress understands that we have to pass a defense bill, a mega defense bill. And because of that, uh, since the president is very unlikely to veto it, now understand that President Trump uh, in one of these bills, uh, not too far back, threatened to veto it. He didn't do it, but he threatened to veto it because uh, no president dares veto a defense department bill because that just puts the country uh, pretty much open to um, to anything, you know, any any danger. So they try to. Uh, there's an, often an effort to attach to those bills all kinds of unrelated provisions that might not pass on their own, although they have substantial support. But they might not pass on their own because they don't have a, enough of a majority uh, to coalesce behind them. So that is not unusual. And what it is, it's really the art of compromise. I mean, many people think compromise is well, you got position A, you got position B, maybe we can uh, find something in the middle uh, that uh, has a little bit of A and a little bit of B. That's one kind of compromise. The other kind of compromise is to attach all kinds of riders so that you get the support of various elements in Congress to support uh, the heart of the bill, uh, which most of them uh, would tend to support, but at least it solidifies the support. Two kinds of compromises, and these mega bills are yet another mm -hmm. example. Right. Um, Alan? Uh, Go ahead, ask, ask a question. Are you saying that uh, congressmen will and Congress people will hold back their vote and say, I'll give you my vote if you put a rider in giving me some money for my state. Sure. To nowhere. That's sure. What, they don't just automatically give their support. Sometimes they hold it back to get something. Right. Um, a classic example of that, uh, and I forget now the details, was Obamacare. In order to get enough people to back Obamacare, uh, there were provisions, and I used to call it, don't call it Obamacare, because Obama basically sort of walked away from it. He sort of said, okay, uh, Congress, here's what I want to do, please handle. And by please handle, and I think I wrote a, an op-ed years ago, um, uh, and I said, you know, don't call it that, call it the Harry Reid bill, call it the Pelosi bill, call it the this bill, call it the that bill, or call it Congress care. Because in order to get what came to be known as Obamacare, there are all kinds of things that were uh, provisions uh, for various health provisions, deductions, this, that, whatever, to get enough members uh, in the Senate and in the House to vote for it. And so one of the reasons that it's such a mishmash is in large measure, quite frankly, in my view, is that Obama didn't push it through. He basically said, here's basically what I wanna do, Congress, please handle. Uh, that's, to me, is not a very effective way to get the bill that you, the president, want. want. Contrast that with Biden, uh, who of course lived through all of this um, uh, as vice president. And if you compare that to his approach to infrastructure and to the so-called compromise that has emerged in the past few days, he's very much been on top of it. He hasn't said, Congress, please handle. He said, this is what I want to do. This is where I'm willing to compromise. And if I can't get it in this initial compromise, I want to do it in the reconciliation. So two presidents, two different approaches. Anyway, I'll-, I'll Hi, I'm welcome back. back. Welcome back, Josh. Thank you, Bob. I Thank heard you. you were talking about reconciliation. That's all I could hear. <laughs> well, we, we were just uh, talking about how bills become laws and that the bill which may have an initial uh, direction <laughs> finds itself with a variety of writers added on, which um, in order to get the number of votes necessary to pass that bill uh, are necessary. And Alan was talking about Obamacare and saying that Obama was not as hands-on as Biden, who was, of course, through Congress for 40 years. So he's much more of a negotiator than 
Obama was. Is that what you find the case to be with Biden? Well, I didn't work. You know, I wasn't here when when President Obama was here. So it's it's hard to, um, right. you know, it's hard to know exactly. But I find that President Biden is very hands on. And the people who work for him, his close advisors are people that I've actually worked with for many years. Ironically, Steve Reschetti and Ron Klain, his chief of staff, are people that I worked with when I worked for President Clinton um, uh, decades ago. So the uh, people who are, you know, they've been around for a while, they know how the place operates. You can have a very candid conversation. I met with Mr. Reschetti today, actually with the Problem Solvers Caucus with Democrats and Republicans to talk about how we get this bipartisan infrastructure bill through the Congress. And, and frankly, that we need to get it done and not let it get derailed and not let it get held hostage by some partisan politics and political games and then just get it done. Uh, we can't afford to wait anymore, which is kind of my point today that I was making to, to uh, Steve Reschetti. But, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, that uh, the president has a deep respect for the Congress. And you know, that's very helpful, right? And I, I, you know, he understands how it operates. He was here, he knows how the import, he, he knows not where to step and where not to overstep. And I think that's very helpful. You're muted, Bob. Sorry. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, Congressman, I got, I got distracted from someone else in the room. Um, let me, no worries. Uh, let me go back and ask you a question that um, seems to be the balancing act of a congressman. Um, how can our government balance supporting Israel wholeheartedly while su simultaneously pushing the conservative government back to the table in pursuit of a two-state solution? Say that one more. Say that one more time. Government will wholeheartedly yet push its conservative government back to the negotiating table to find a two-state solution. Well, I don't think that's really in conflict with each other. You know, I, I think you can, you know, we, we, those of us who stand by Israel and stand by the relationship also stand by the importance of a two-state solution and believe deeply in it. And I think you can have tough love with your allies, just like we do with all of our allies. Uh -huh. and, and I think we're going to, you know, we should do everything we can. Listen, the, the, I was very lucky to be at the accord signing with some interesting new bedfellows that Israel had has now um, at, at the end of um, uh, the, uh, the end of President Trump's term. And, and I think if you had asked me years ago, if there was any chance that we would have the, of the Abraham Accords being okay, right? I think many of us on this call would have said no way, but frankly, the, the world changes. And the question is, can we keep, do we, do we keep making policy and pushing our, and can, can keep, and keep pushing our allies accordingly? And I think, you know, we have to basically make it pretty clear to the new government in Israel that our expectation is they're going to work to finding a two-state solution. It's eluded us for a long time. I worked, as I mentioned, I worked for President Clinton um, during the Y Accords, and I thought we were going to, and I think the President Clinton did as well, I thought we were going to actually get, get a deal done. Um, and I remember when it fell apart, and we were so close, and we haven't been as close since. But I think we can get back. I think we can. Um, I think we can. And by the way, just so you know, that's the, that is the capital behind me. I was going to say, I like, the backdrop, I like the backdrop, but I guess it's not just a phony backdrop. It's the real deal. And that's the real deal. Uh, I just left. You saw me. Uh, leave. Right. I, I was literally sitting a foot off the chamber. Uh, okay. So, so uh, and you got you got to see me go speak and, and then come back. <laughs> All right. That's so. very good. So in, going along with that same piece, it says, per your Twitter page, I see you're looking to introduce a new law to... Um, Curve. Let me get it here. Um, for your Twitter page, you're looking into a new law to curb Hamas financial backers. Can you explain that? To what? What? Which law? The one to. It's on your Twitter page. You're trying to introduce a new law to curb Hamas's financial backers. Oh, yeah. The anti. Yes, of course. Um, yes, I introduced that bill uh, formally last Monday, I think, and with um, Brian Mass from Florida. <laughs> And th that bill focuses on going after those who um, uh, provide financial or other support to Hamas. 
Um, and it's a piece of legislation that I introduced last Congress that passed with strong support. And I think it's really important that we get it to the floor in this Congress as well. And so um, that's what I'm focused on. All right, good to hear. Uh, another question for you. Have you considered pushing for federal legislation that matches what many states are doing to keep the high prescription drug costs down? Um, most large insurance insurers are refusing to uh, accept manufacturer coupons to patients deductibles and out of pocket at maximums. This increased patient costs dramatically, which directly <laughs> undermines the purpose of these coupons. Several well, states, what do you think? That's a very complicated question, but I'll try to give, I'll try to, without keeping you here all night, give an answer that, uh, right. <laughs> um, uh, you know, first of all, I believe fundamentally that we have to get the cost of prescription drugs down, right? As I think we all do. I think a lot of that is through competition and through generic, and especially through generics and, and making sure that we can get more generics to the marketplace to increase competition. And also that patent games aren't played so that certain uh, drug manufacturers can avoid um, generic, you know, having generic competition. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I also believe that if you, you know, how much you know about the, the, the cycle of pharmaceuticals and, you know, before it gets to the CVS counter, what happens along the way, but there's a, a group, there's something called PBMs, which are basically the middle, the, the middleman in, in the distribution. And what happens is that the drug manufacturers provide a coupon at lower cost, and the, the middleman takes that coupon and, and does not either keeps it for themselves or they don't pass it along, or, or the, your, your, your company, if you work for a company, keeps those discounts and doesn't share it with the end user or the, or the you know, uh, you or me when we buy a prescription. Um, so um, uh, I think there's a lot of reform that needs to happen, especially on the transparency side to that process to see what happens to those coupons and those discounts along the way and who's taking them and why aren't they getting to the end user. That said, I also think we should be very careful not well, you know, when we, we, so you would realize as you studied this, that a lot of times other people are marking up the prescription massively and it's not the manufacturer. So we have, that's why the transparency piece is really important as well. Lastly, um, I'm also very concerned, you know, like a lot of people are, um, that we don't take drastic measures that would discourage investment in R&D for, for life-saving drugs. You know, if you think about how we've done in New Jersey, which you know, there was sort of a, been the medicine uh, chest to the, to the country of developing some of the greatest innovations in the world, including, by the way, playing a role in our companies in, in the vaccine, which is, you know, right. I, I would argue our companies literally just saved humanity. So I say that because I think these things are more complicated than, than it seems at first, but there's lots of ways to get the cost down. And that's what I'm very focused on. We're glad you're working on it. Let me shift gears on you. Uh, as you know, President Trump continues to spread the big lie. Um, what are your, uh, what's the uh, Republican colleagues in the Problem Solvers Caucus saying about this behind closed doors? Can you share anything? Sure, I mean, I, I, I you know, and we have 29 Republicans in the Problem Solvers. Four of them voted, in, you know, and not to recognize the uh, electoral college, um, and we had some very tough conversations. I think the bottom line with those four members, and there was an immediate need to um, recognize who's president, President Biden, and also be willing to work with President Biden. Our group is the group that voted for the January 6th commission to the Republicans in our group to establish it. They're the group that generally stands up for voting rights and for the, for the things that I think we'd all probably agree are, are, are the reasonable right things. Um, um, and I have very little patience for extremism on either side. And so, you know, that's what I'd say. I see there's a question on Gateway also in the chat. Right. Um, and, you know, I just want to make sure I get to that because I, um, um, was there yesterday in, in the tunnel on a train with Secretary Buttigieg, Secretary of Transportation, oh, wow. um, um, with uh, some members of the congressional delegation focused on getting that done. 
And frankly, I, I think that's critically important. It's very important for our district. 20% of the GDP of the region runs through our, that, that, that transit line. It's 110, right now you've got a 110 year old train tunnel that's literally crumbling. We gotta get it fixed. And I think we're gonna get the resources out of this infrastructure package to get it fixed. Finally, we've gotten, you know, since the President Biden's taken over, we've already gotten some of the approvals that were being held up in the last administration. So that's great. So we're finally making really, really important progress. And I have time for like, yeah, go ahead. Two more, two more questions, can we do that? Yeah, sure. Where the infrastructure bill, how far away is it from passage? Um, I hope that by the time we go to summer recess in August, it, be, it is law. All right, now there's another bill which Biden wants to pass beyond the infrastructure, which has to do more with a social contract <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the rec reconciliation package. Yes, it's more yeah. social infrastructure and jobs. Yeah. Does that have less chance? What do you think about that? I think in its current incarnation, it has much less of a chance. Even with a full, uh, with the full votes, do you have enough votes? Is well, you only have a four seat. You only have a four seat majority in the House and a 50-50 Senate. You know, you only need 50 Senate votes in the Senate. There, I I've made it very clear one thing. I will not support something that raises taxes without uh, that, you know, in other with one in one hand, unless it actually it, overall, I will not support something that raises taxes on my district. If, if there are changes to the tax code that affect families, um, that I, I've insisted that or small businesses that you that we fully reinstate the state level tax deduction. Um, uh, you know, I'm also so I, I'm very tax sensitive given how the high cost of taxes in our and cost of living in our district in our okay. area i want taxes to come down or for life to be more affordable i'm also concerned about the level of spending we've spent five trillion dollars in the last year it's i want to be careful on how much debt we pile on to future generations um so whereas physical infrastructure has a clear return on investment i'm i'm cautious about other spending and i, I i'm going to be very wary of spending a lot of additional resources and of, 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 of changes to the tax code that are gonna raise taxes on our families. By the way, uh, congratulations from one of our members on the Chamber of Commerce Jefferson Hamilton Award for bipartisan work. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I was, all, I was named by the Luger Center at Georgetown the most bipartisan Democrat in the Congress this year. So oh. I, was, uh, I was proud of that too. I know that cuts both ways. Some people like me for that, others don't, but. <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, last question, I guess we can. I'm sorry, Congressman, you have to go. Yeah, I'm going to get yelled at. What's the last question, Bob? Last question. Interested to hear your thoughts on the unprecedented spike in violent crime and law enforcement practices. Well, that's also a big question. I'm, I'm, I'm very pro law enforcement um, and concerned with any spike in crime. You know, I'm, I, I think our law enforcement in New Jersey. Um, where we have not had in, in our part of the district a, a surge in crime. Um, our, does a, our law enforcement does a, gr a phenomenal job and we need to make sure they have the resources they need um, to do their job. I also think you can have reforms and also stand by law enforcement. And I think in New Jersey, we've already had a lot of the law and a lot of the reforms that, that, are, are, that people are talking about, like ending chokeholds except for self-defense or making changes to no-knock warrants so there are changes that, you know, I believe we, um, reforms we can make by also standing by law enforcement strongly like I do. And with that, I just want to thank you very much for having me, Ira. Thank you so much for, for organizing this. And Bob, thanks for doing such a great job of bringing us all together. I'm all sorry. Right, that from your busy schedule, thank you. It's been a privilege to talk to you. Maybe we can schedule you and see, meet you in person and have a little more I, uh, conversation with the room I, people. I'd love that. Good to see you. Thank you, guys. Have a great night. All right, Alan, it's now your chance for post-interview commentary. Okay. Well, I mean, he's told you his positions. He's told you he's a middle of the roader, and that uh, is uh, the way he got elected, and that's the way he anticipates staying elected. The only thing I would add to this is um, uh, 
what you saw him. I mean, you saw him rush from one uh, obligation to another obligation. And that is something that uh, surprises many people, certainly surprised my students. If you take a look at a congressman's daily schedule, his log, her log, uh, it is chock filled with meetings with fellow members of Congress, with lobbyists, uh, with uh, reelection uh, supporters. Uh, and then of course, there's the time to actually make the speeches and to negotiate with your colleagues and, and to vote. It is, um, it is a, a relentless job. Uh, and I think most people don't understand that. I mean, every time you, know, you open the newspaper, you see Congress is on recess. Uh, they're going on recess, of course, uh, for the July 4th, and they typically go on two week recesses. And that's not, um, that's not vacation. Understand that for a member of Congress, the recess is a way to meet with lobbyists, meet with constituents, go to those parades, go to those graduation ceremonies, uh, maybe spend some time actually reading the laws that they're going to be asked to pass on. They're constantly in phone contact with, with their colleagues. It is a relentless job. And that's something uh, many people don't realize. They think, oh, well, you know, they show up for two weeks, they make a couple of speeches on the floor, then they go on vacation for two weeks. Um, that's not the way it works. If you want to be an effective member of Congress, you're gonna be working every single day. And I would also point this out, you know, we're at home, uh, talking and uh, watching this it basically during our leisure time. Um, he was working, okay? He was working on the floor, but he was also working, talking to us and presumably saying things that he believes would be well received. Um, a member of Congress um, is in constant work mode. And that is something that uh, most of us, I think, don't appreciate. Now, you know, that doesn't mean you have to have sympathy for them. I mean, they wanted the job, they ran for the job, but I think you have to appreciate what the job is. It's constant work. Um, and that's something I think we tend to forget. All right, listen, I wanted to thank everyone who joined tonight. Alan, you've been super in helping me out in that interim and adding your expertise always. I know you enjoy it as much as, as, as you enjoy it as much. So I know that we didn't twist your arm too bad. And um, it really is an asset for our synagogue to um, have this kind of a dialogue. Uh, as I said, I hope for October maybe, we'll set up a date when you all can come back in live and have a chance to visit or have a panel with him. And we can get into, we didn't answer all the questions we had and they were really excellent questions. So thank you and everyone else for participating. And um, you should all feel good about participating with Temple Israel and a very high level of uh, dialogue with certainly a congressman, even a local congressman, it's still important. As, you, as Alan said, that background was the capital. It was not a false background. It was not in Hawaii. He was certainly doing his job running from place to place. So a very interesting window on our world. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us on this Tuesday night. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, hope to join us on July 8th for Scott Salmon. Um, he's certainly worthwhile talking to and learning more about voter suppression. Something I think we all need to have a hand in because our voices are silent, um, it's a possibility for this to take hold. And you know, the democracy we believe we're in should have that, in my belief, an opportunity to vote in as, as easy a fashion as possible. And for the people to make up this, this uh, fiction that the laws or the votes were not authentic <clears throat> and to push for identification cards or other means of means testing um, is just crazy. So. I guess that's the state of the world as we see it tonight. And I want to thank everyone and have a great night. Um, any last minute questions while we have Alan on the space and place, please unmute and ask Alan a question. No question, but I want to thank you, Bob, for coordinating all of this. It was great. My pleasure. I'm yes, glad everyone. You, it's great. Yeah. You're, you're doing a great job and, and we all <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I enjoyed as much as you enjoy being part of it. So uh, thank everyone and stay cool. Have a great night.